Okay, let's uh, get started. Um, before we talk about HCI, I just wanted to take a minute or two to talk about last night's events. Um, we spent a lot of time in this class talking about how people differ physically and culturally. Obviously, people differ politically. Um, people in this room maybe feel very differently about the outcomes uh, of last night. Um, some of you may feel somewhat uh, upset about the events of last night. If you are feeling particularly upset, I hope you will avail yourself of counseling services. Um, I've also put on an extra office hour after class today. If you feel the need to talk about what happened, I will be in my office and I'm happy to chat about, uh, about anything. Um, for this country, this is sort of uh, unprecedented territory, so who knows what's going to happen moving, moving forward. I would just ask uh, you to do your best to listen to others despite their differences of opinions uh, and despite your own feelings about that. And on the flip side, I hope you will also uh, have the courage to speak up if you feel the need to, to do so. Okay, anyone else have anything they'd like to say about last night's events? No? Okay. Let's move back to, to HCI then. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about where we're going in the rest of the semester. Today you will be handing in the 10th and final deliverable. Any questions about deliverable 10? No? We're all good? Okay. Uh, we're going to switch over now from deliverables to weekly reports. So between now and the end of the semester, uh, which for us is going to be Friday, the December 16th. You are going to be writing and submitting three reports. So instead of submitting uh, images or video, you're going to be submitting a weekly report. And the bulk of these reports are going to have to do with user testing. So by the end of today, hopefully you have a functioning, a fully functioning system in which if you plunk down a leap motion device in front of someone and they wave their hand over it, there will be enough material in the interaction that will guide them all the way through to learning the 10 uh, digits in the ASL uh, language. I want you to prove to us how well or how, how easily or how difficult it was for the user to do so using your system. Just as a, a, a sort of a guiding principle here, we are not looking for you to try and prove to us how usable your system is. That's not really the goal. The goal is for you to learn from your users and demonstrate to us that you could incorporate the feedback from user testing to improve your system and then demonstrate to us through a second round of user testing that your improvements have made your system more usable, more efficient, more engaging, more acceptable uh, to, to the user. Right. So the goal is not to prove to us how good your system is, but how well you were able to learn from your users and how that feedback was able to guide your system to become more usable. That's what we're looking for over the next three weeks that we have for the, the semester. Okay, uh, we've got three reports, and I'm going to talk about weekly report one in a moment. In weekly report one, you're going to be writing a document that describes your plan for user testing. So you're not going to do any user testing between now and next Wednesday. Um, and then report two is going to be assigned the Wednesday just before we break for Thanksgiving. And hopefully, when you're home for Thanksgiving, you will, uh, before or after the turkey, be able to recruit family and friends to do some user testing. And then, in report two, you're going to document the results of that user testing. In report number three, you're going to talk about how you use the results from user testing to improve your system. So report number three is going to be a demonstration of improvements in your system based on user testing. And then finally, during the final uh, exam period, which we have on Friday, December 16th, you're going to be presenting your final version or version 2.0, and you're going to try and demonstrate to us results from a second round of user testing. And hopefully the improvements you made are going to show in the measurements from that second round of user testing that your system became more usable or more efficient or more engaging or more acceptable or whatever dimensions you were trying to improve in terms of the HCI aspects of your system. Any questions about that, where we're going? 
Okay, so let's dive into uh, report one then. Uh, as I mentioned in report one, you're going to be writing and submitting uh, a user testing plan. Please make sure this is just simply a PDF uh, document. You'll just be submitting a PDF document to, um, uh, to Blackboard. This document is going to be made up of three sections. In the first section, you're going to be describing, uh, you're going to be describing a use case. And if you go back to lecture seven, um, and read up on use cases, you're going to be describing a hypothetical interaction uh, uh, between your user and your system. So in writing this use case, I want you to imagine turning on your system, plunking a leap motion device down in front of someone who's never seen a leap motion device before. You don't say a word, they look at the screen, and based on what they see on the screen, they do this, right? from that all the way through to learning ASL, or f failing to learn the digits of ASL, how is that interaction going to play out? And that's what you're going to be describing in this first of three sections of the first report. So here, just sort of to get you started, on this first section, I want you to write this as an itemized list. So the user sees the device on the table in front of them. On the screen, they see this. Um, after typing in their name, they see an image instructing them to do X, whatever that is. Because of that visualization, the user does this. If they don't do that, after five seconds, a different visualization comes up, uh, and so on. When they eventually do put their hand over the device, the visualization changes and they will see this, dot, dot, dot. When they see that, it causes them to do that, and so on and so forth, right? So you're describing the system does this, the user reacts in this way, the system reacts to them in this way, the user reacts in this way, back and forth and back and forth. Um, I want you to itemize the list so you can sort of put in square brackets here instructions to us, the reader. So I'm reading you this use case and I'm imagining this interaction playing out between your user and your system. Um, your user is waving their hand over the device and they're looking at the screen and they're not really paying attention and their hand wanders outside the field of view of the lead motion device. Your instruction to me as the reader is to go step to step C. So I know that now they see an image instructing them to bring their hand back into the device's field of view and so on and so forth, right? So this is almost like pseudocode, but it includes the user, right? What's going on between the user and the system, right? Remember this sort of underlying cartoon for HCI, which is the output of the user becomes the input for the system, and the output of the system becomes the input to the user. You're describing how this feedback loop is going to uh, play out. And again, we don't need you to paint us a rosy picture of how this is going to go perfectly. We would actually like to see that you've thought a little bit of what happens if something goes wrong. What happens if the device, the hand leaves the device's field of view? What happens if there's some occlusion? Is the user aware that the leap motion device is incorrectly registering the sign because of occlusion or not? What does your system do in these cases? What does your system project to the users to help them correct and carry on. That's, that's the starting point of your plan for user testing. Okay. Uh, the, we want you to write this as a, as a um, enumerated list because the following week when you actually do some user testing, you are going to be sitting next to your user and you are going to be watching them interact with the system. And again, you are going to try and say, hopefully not say anything, and you are going to be ticking off does, do these things actually happen? So in an actual user interaction, did A, B, and C play out and then something else happened? So you thought D was going to happen, but instead something else happened. When did the interaction go off script? Right? That's the first sort of quantitative metric you're going to get back from user testing as something unexpected that hopefully will get you thinking differently about how you're going to have to improve your system for version 2.0. Right? What improvements are you going to make that when you do subsequent testing with either the same user or another naive user that the interaction plays out much more in the way that you expect it? Uh, you'll remember Jeff Springer was here, the CEO of Zemo Corporation, and he was using you all as guinea pigs. Uh, a lot of those interactions that went on in the classroom, he was telling me, were not what they were expecting. 
which is good, right? That's good for them. They were able to take that and go back and improve the tutorial of uh, Zemo, right? So again, we're not trying to make sure everything goes right. You're actually looking to see where things go right and where things go wrong. And based on that divergence, what do you need to change to make sure it doesn't go wrong the next time around? Okay. Okay, uh, in the second section of the document, I want you to talk a lot about measurement. And here I want you to be as specific as possible. So as I mentioned, when you do user testing the following week, the user is going to be sitting in front of uh, your screen with their hand over the device. You're going to be sitting looking obliquely at them so you can see the screen and you can see their face. You're going to be marking down on a piece of paper this, but also marking down some other data to measure this interaction. Right? Some of the metrics from your user testing, your system is going to capture anyways. Right? How long does it take for the user to sign the digit correctly? How often do they fail? And so on. But there's a lot of other aspects of that interaction that I want you to try and describe for me in the second section and mark down. So again, just to get you thinking about this, I gave you a few things that you might want to put in section two, which is how often does the user look at you, right? So they don't know what they're supposed to do next. They look at you, and even just by looking at you, that's them non-verbally asking for some guidance. And again, hopefully, you should be able to do nothing more than look back at the screen, meaning the screen will tell you what to do, right? Do they look at you and ask for verbal clarification? I don't know what to do next. What, what am I supposed to do, right? How often do they, how, how often does that happen? Just mark it down. And if they're really confused, then tell them what they need to do next and carry on. Make sure you make a note of exactly what state your program was in when they asked you for verbal clarification, right? Be as specific as you can because this data is going to help you pinpoint where you need to improve things the next time uh, around. How often, for example, does the user cancel the interaction? Are they shaking their hand? How often does their hand go out of the field of view and back in? What other sorts of things are, is the user trying to, to do? How often do they swear at your system? How often do they whatever, right? Okay. You tell us what those metrics are, and it should be clear from those metrics how you're going to record it. How many times do they look at you? How many times do they look at you and ask for verbal clarification? How many times do they look at their own hand? How many times do they shake their hand? All of that kind of data. How often does it happen and where in your code, which state was the program in when that, that happened? Okay. Finally, in the third and final section of this document, I want you to describe how you envision improving your system depending on how these metrics play out. So this one's a little tricky because you're not doing user testing to the following until the following week. But I want you to show us some evidence here that you're thinking ahead to user testing. So in the third section here, you might say, um, if the user keeps asking for verbal clarification in state number two, which for my program is when the user's hand is in the field of view but has strayed away from the center, every or 75% of the time when the system was in state number two, the user was confused or didn't know what to do. If that situation arises, then I think I will probably go back in and change state number two in the following way, right? So you're already starting to anticipate what happens depending on what kinds of metrics you, you get back, right? We talked about this in the HCI design process, so in lectures seven, uh, eight, and nine, you can go back and have a look at that. Um, what, what if you see standard deviation in the metrics, right? So what if you do testing with two or three family members over the Thanksgiving break, and for one person that metric scored high, for another medium and another low, right? What does that mean? If you get standard deviation on that metric, give us some ideas about how you think you might need to go back and change your code, right? So in the third section here, we're looking for a particular metric a particular statistical summary of that metric. So you're looking for low mean or high mean or low standard deviation or high standard deviation. And depending on that situation, you have some plans for what might happen. Clearly, you're not going to be able to anticipate every situation. I just want to see that you're thinking about repercussions, right? So if in actual user testing over Thanksgiving, the particular 
uh, metrics that you sketched out in this third section don't come about, that's fine. You see, oh, actually, it was this metric that scored low on my users. That you're getting in the habit of thinking about, again, going from those metrics back into the code and thinking about where you need to make improvements. Okay, I think about half a page for each of these three sections should be more than sufficient. So about a page and a half for this PDF that you'll be uh, submitting. If it's a little bit longer, that's, that's fine too. Any questions about report number one? Okay, so just back to the schedule for a moment. So again, you're going to be writing this report between now and next Wednesday, and then armed with this report, uh, we'll talk about report two, which is how to actually conduct user testing. Over the Thanksgiving recess, you're going to do some user testing and collect some of these metrics, and that's all going to go into report number two. Report number three is you're going to show us how you improved your system based on those metrics. All good? Okay. So let's carry on with the lecture material then. We're working our way through this section on looking outward, deploying embedded devices out into the physical world. And as we increasingly instrument our world with technology that is continuously sensing and in some cases acting on the physical world, what are the sorts of things that were difficult or impossible to do without that instrumentation? We looked at social network inference, activity tagging, and we finished last time by talking about this rather controversial study, which has become known as the Human Speech Ohm Project. So this is a meme now, right? If you add O-M-E on the end of anything, it means you're trying to capture the entirety of that thing, right? The genome, the uh, connectome of the brain, every neuron and every synapse. The speech ohm, in this case, was an attempt to capture the entire set of experiences surrounding a young child as it starts to acquire speech. Okay. So we looked at how this sort of this approach to studying this question or trying to answer this scientific question of how children acquire language is different from the standard way, which is I have a hypothesis about how I think children acquire language. I do a study in the lab, and the results of that study provide support for or against my hypothesis. In Deb Roy's approach, the idea was, let's not make any hypotheses. Let's just collect uh, an obscene amount of data and then dive through that data and look for patterns which then suggest hypotheses about how children acquire language. So this is a data-driven approach, right? Instead of starting with hypotheses and collecting data, we're going to collect data and then start to form hypotheses based on the data that we have. We watched this video, uh, the TED Talk last time of Deb Roy describing one or a few experiments that they did given this data set, including this experiment, which was the birth of a word. And he played that audio track of his child acquiring the word water. And we'll come back to that uh, in a few slides. OK. Let's talk about uh, the instrumentation first. Uh, as he mentioned, in their home, they instrumented uh, 11 rooms with omnidirectional cameras. And in there, they also had 14 microphones. It was a fisheye lens, so it was an attempt to capture basically all the video or everything the child might be seeing when it's in that room, and hopefully pretty much everything that the child might be hearing. They collected that data. Uh, uh, over um, uh, an 18-month period uh, from nine months of age to 24 months of age, which is the language-sensitive part of a child's uh, life. And you're going to see this in some data in a moment. This is sort of the sponge phase when children start to acquire uh, their mother tongue at a, an amazing rate. For over 4,000 hours of recording time, um, which gives about 200 terabytes of data. So for a standard laptop, that's, what is that? That's about 800 to 2,000 laptops, current laptops, right? So a pretty big chunk of data. This was done back in 2009 when this was really a big chunk of, of data. About 9.6 hours per day. They believe they captured about 70 to 80% of the child's waking auditory and visual experience. Not the child's somatosensory experience, not what the child felt when the child grabbed an object, right? So only sight and sound. Obviously, other sensor modalities also probably impinge upon uh, a human's ability to acquire 
uh, language, and five or six cameras were active at any given time. Okay, here's, a, here's just a, a snippet from the reading from the research paper which makes this point about trying not to do theory-laden uh, science. Right? So the minute I come up with a hypothesis or theory, I've already sort of biased my study, right? I'm going to decide what data to collect based on my theory, right? I'm already sort of biased in a certain way. So Professor Roy is arguing that uh, traditionally things were done in this theory-laden manner, uh, but in this case they want to try and do things uh, uh, unburdened by theory, right? We're just going to go in and collect the data. Once we have the data, then we will look at the data and form theories based on what we see in the, the data. Okay. Okay, back to the instrumentation for a moment. So here's sort of the pipeline. They have this raw sensor, uh, they have this raw audio and video. They're going to try and compress all of this raw data down into language, people, activities and objects, right? This is kind of sounding familiar, perhaps, right? So who, what, where, when, and how. And then once they have those objects and how they're changing over space and time, then they can start to formulate and hopefully prove different theories about language acquisition. So in terms of just the raw audio, so here's the audio here. So like we've seen several times already, they have sort of two layers of machine learning going on here. The lower level is taking this raw audio and assisted by actual humans, they were trying to pull out of that raw audio who was saying what and how. So word level speech transcription, what's, what's this particular word being said at this point in the audio track and by whom, and prosody features, how were they saying it. Right? So we've heard that, we've seen that already, what was the pitch of the voice? Was the word being said in mommy or daddy talk, or was it being said in <coughs> adult talk? What was the, the way in which the words were spoken? Okay. Once we get to that, now we have who, what, where, and when. Now we can start to add on a second level, which is a machine learning algorithm, which is going to say, um, it seems that whenever a child uttered a given word at a certain time, this particular situation happened just prior to it, right? So the second level here is trying to take as input who, what, where, and when, and make a prediction about when exactly a child is going to utter a word for the first time, right? So something that this particular machine learning algorithm might learn is that if there is a word that's being heard from the parents or the three caregivers, so there's mom, dad, and a nanny in this house during this period, so if the, the three caregivers are saying this word a lot, then this word is going to be uttered for the first time earlier than another word which is her, spoken relatively rarely by the three caregivers. Right? That's a particular relationship between, between who, what, where, and when, and the thing that we want the machine learning algorithm to do, which is to predict how early or how late a child says a word for the first time. Why is it that this particular child's first word was this rather than this other word? So far so good? Okay. Okay, um, this is a pretty daunting thing to do for the audio as well as the video. So they created some interesting HCI visualizations. So they made some actual tools for their human analysts because they had to process uh, what do they have to process here? 4,260 hours of audiovisual, right? Things have gotten better in the last seven years, so machines are getting better at pulling words out of raw audio and faces out of raw video, but still was pretty wonky back in 2009, so humans were in the loop in this case. Audio was visualized with the spectrogram, which you can see here. So a spectrogram is showing along the vertical axis here the power of different frequencies. So at each point, as I march from the bottom up one of these columns, the darker the pixel is, the stronger that particular frequency is. So at this point in time, just above the up arrow there, you can see that right here there is a strong uh, low frequency sound 
And then as time marched on, and I can't see what the axis is here, this is probably a few seconds, over a few seconds, the power switched from low frequency to high frequency. So there might have been a deep voice that was transitioning to a high pitch voice or something like that. It's not clear from this picture whether that was actually voice, but that kind of thing. Once you get good at this, you can start to look at a spectrogram and see speech, ambient noise, uh, a shower running, the tap running, the toilet flushing, all these other sounds in a house and start to narrow in on where is their speech and then assuming that there is speech, what actually was said. So the raw, the under, the, the lower level machine learning algorithm was trying to pull out, let me see if I can make this a little larger so you can see it, was pulling out its guess about what the machine thought it heard in that short audio snippet. The human analyzer would click play, would listen to the raw audio and say, yeah, that's definitely, that's correct. This is the caregiver speaking. This is the child speaking. This sounds like it's someone on a TV or a smartphone or whatever, right? So a lot of tagging of speech from this raw audio uh, track. Uh, if it was wrong, then they would type in uh, what was actually heard. So the machine was wrong, obviously, back in 2009 quite a bit, so they might correct uh, the speech. Okay, um, so they made this, this little uh, widget called Blitzscribe. So for every one hour of audio, it took 1.5 hours to transcribe. They've got over 4,000 hours of raw audio, right? This is a pretty daunting task. So the machine learning algorithm was trying to winnow out uh, was trying to winnow out obvious places where there was no sound or ambient sound and just try and focus in on where, on parts of the audio track where there happened, where there was likely to be words and then the human analysts were helping to identify what exactly was said when and where, in what room it was occurring. Okay. So that's just to give you sort of an idea about the sorts of tools they were developing, the sort of processing. Now we get to the fun part, which is now that you know who, what, where, and when, can we start to develop theories about language acquisition? Here's the first, uh, here's the first visualization from the data. So on the horizontal axis here, we have the, uh, lifetime, uh, the lifetime of the child from, again, from nine months of age to 24 months of age. The vertical axis reports the number of word births, which means for any given month, how many words in that month spoken by the child was spoken by the child for the first time, right? So maybe in month number 10 here, the child said water for the first time. We increase this counter of number of one word births by one. Maybe they utter the word uh, Spaghetti for the first time, we increment it by one again. Okay, what happened? For this one child. I mean, as they learn the vernacular, um, there's less like, things that they can learn. So that they're not, like, the frequency of learning is really going to decrease. Okay, so there's our first theory, right? So there's only so many sort of basic words that maybe a child is wor learning during this period and at some point there aren't that many more to learn so the rate of word births goes down that's one hypothesis and again we could go dive back into the data and try and look for additional evidence to support or try and disprove that theory when they say word birth, do they mean clearly spoken Clearly spoken. So if you go back and watch the first few minutes of the TED Talk, you could hear the child saying, ga, 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 wa, wa, wa. There were things that were clearly antecedents of the word. So those were things that kind of sounded like water, according to the caregivers. And it was usually spoken when the child was near water. So again, theory is starting to creep in here a little bit. And then right at the end of that audio track that he played, the child said, water. And that was the first time, as far as anyone could tell, in the raw audio track, that the child said the full adult form of the word water. That was it, right? There was obviously a lot of babbling and these sort of proto words before it. They're looking for the, the birth of the adult form of the word. So the child clearly continued on improving in terms of language after month 20 here. 
and the rate of word births is going down. So what's going on here? Can we be a little bit more specific? Is it maybe because the complexity of the words have kind of reached like a peak? Perhaps, right? So maybe it was sort of one and two syllable words that the child was tackling, <laughs> and they've sort of, they've maybe absorbed the, the vast amount of those simple words by, uh, by month 20. There are many fewer words that have three or more syllables, right? And maybe that's what's going into these bins here. It's not clear, right? We could go back and look at the particular words in each of these bins and maybe redraw it based on the number of syllables in the word, which would be, again, evidence for against these hypotheses about why this happened. For those of you that have learned a second language, what happens, right? In the first few weeks or few months, you're just acquiring vocabulary, right? This is this, this is this, this is this, this is this. And at a certain point, there's kind of an inflection point where what starts to happen instead? You're still learning new vocabulary, but you're doing much more of something else. Well, you get away with a minimum amount of vocabulary and just kind of filling in the blanks later. Absolutely, right? So there's a few important words that you need. Yep. Grammar. Grammar, right? Okay, so I know... If I want water, I know to point and say water. If I want the door closed, I know to point at the door and just say door. But if there's other things that I may want one of you to do, I'm going to have to combine words together in combinations and permutations, right? What are those combinations and permutations? So I think that's a pretty good hypothesis for what's going on here. This is a transition from an emphasis on vocabulary to grammar. But again, who knows? We have to go in and look at the data to prove or disprove that hypothesis. Okay, this one's kind of interesting. So uh, again, we've got a plot here with age along the horizontal axis, and each dot in this scatter plot corresponds to, again, a word that was uttered by the child for the first time, the adult form of that word. So for example, uh, I think water was one of the first words that this child uttered. So this dot down here might be water. And the height of this dot is uh, the log frequency of the word in caregiver speech, which is basically the frequency at which the other three members of the household were uttering that word. You can see that there is a red line that's fit to this and a negative 0.29. This is the R value or the correlation. We, we saw correlations and anti-correlations last week. So there's an anti-correlation here, which means what? Absolutely. The more that it's spoken by the caregivers, and it doesn't say here whether the child heard the word or not, just that that word showed up in the raw audio track being emitted by one of the three caregivers, the earlier the child tended to say it for the first time, which seems kind of intuitive, right? If instead we had plotted this data and got a positive correlation, that might have seemed strange, right? A positive correlation would have meant that the more the word was uttered, the longer it took the child to utter it for the first time. So this kind of at least matches my intuition about what's going on here. Okay. This is um, just, so again, we're trying to figure out what predicts word birth. How we're, tr we're trying to predict the time of a word birth. What in the child's experience caused that child to learn that word earlier or later? And in this case, the hypothesis here is that it has something to do with how often the caregivers said it. But this probably isn't the only thing that influenced how early the child acquired any given word, right? There are probably other things that influenced it, such as? So how often the child heard mommy or daddy or the nanny saying this word? What else might make a difference here? Location. How much time they spend in certain rooms? With uh, absolutely, right? So if the caregivers uttered the word water when the child was near water, did that help the child acquire water more than if the caregivers had uttered the word water distant from water? Was it something about the fact that the child uttered the word because the, wor the child was starting to understand that this sound, water, means these things. Who knows, right? That's an interesting hypothesis. Yep. Um, how often they get what they want? 
how often they get what they want, right? So a big part of language acquisition is social contingency, right? So social contingency meaning there's a social interaction between me and mom and dad. And I learn that by doing certain things, I get what I want. And maybe I start out by just screaming as loud as I can, and that works pretty well for a while. And then I learn that if I start actually asking for things or uttering these other sounds, I get what I want faster, right? That's another one that might be important, right? So it's probably not just how often I hear a word, but all these other dynamics are going on. How do we attack this problem? This next figure takes a little bit of time to digest, so we're going to go through this slowly. In this plot here, they were saying, okay, let's just look at how often the word was uttered by caregivers, so that we're using one feature to predict the time of word birth. Now they're going to add a second feature, uh, P down here, which is how the word is said. So P for prosody. So F is frequency, right? Just the number of times that it, was, that it was said by the caregiver. P is this value that's going to be set between 0 and 1, um, where I can't remember how it actually goes, but let's say that P, uh, if a word is uttered, and it was uttered in the most adult form of that word, mommy, that, that word would get a P of 1. If it was uttered in baby talk, which is typically that the vowels are elongated, so it's the same word, mommy, but now pronounced as mommy, then it would get a p-value of zero. So p is sort of the amount of exaggeration of the vowels in the word. So we're going to now ask the question of how do these two features in combination predict early word birth? So is it just that the child heard the word a lot, regardless of whether they heard the adult form of it or the baby talk version of it, or is it some combination of these two features. So we're going to take F and P and try and predict A, which was the age of the child in months when the child spoke that word for the first time. So far so good? Okay, we're going to introduce another variable, alpha, and you can think of alpha as a slider bar. We're going to slide alpha between 0 and 1, and uh, it's not actually written here on the slide. Alpha. So what they actually did was the following. So when alpha is 0 here, then alpha equals 0 is equivalent to this figure here. So it's just taking f, right? So if alpha is 0, we get 1f plus 0p, which is just f. And we're going to see how f predicts a. So here's f, and here's a. And we know for that particular setting of alpha, alpha equals 0, we know how well f predicts a. It has a relatively weak negative correlation. It's somewhat predictive, but it's kind of weak. Is there some other setting of alpha that combines f and p to predict a better? Now there's a little, there's something about this figure that seems not quite right, because if we look here at alpha equals 0, in this case, they're plotting now on the vertical axis the correlation, the R score, which they said for alpha equals 0 is minus 0.29, but it looks like it's more like 0 0.275. So something seems not quite right here. But I hope you get the basic idea. So they said for F, how well does F predict A? It predicts it about this good. Then they move the alpha slider bar a little bit to the, uh, to the right, which means now the next dot along is 99% F and like 1% uh, P. And as we keep sliding alpha from the left to the right, we get all the way out here, where when alpha equals 1, we have a, we're just using P, just the way in which the word was spoken. And we wanted to see whether just P, how well just P predicts uh, A. How well did just P predict A? That's this point up here. Did P predict A well or not? This plot takes a little bit to wrap your brain around. So if we 
if this was an interactive plot, imagine you could click on each one of these dots. Every time you click on one of these dots, it shows you a scatter plot over here. If you plot, if you if you uh, clicked on this dot here, it would give you this specific scatter plot, which has a co an anti-correlation of 0.29, negative correlation of 0.29. If we were to click on this dot up here, it would give us a different scatter plot over here, which would be A on the horizontal axis and P <coughs> on the vertical axis now, instead of F, and we would get a different slope for the red line. The slope of that red line would be minus whatever that is, 0.16. How well does P predict A? Not very well, Not very well right? Worse than F, right? So it's 0.16, it's kind of weak. Maybe the child's being influenced by baby talk here, maybe not. They're much more likely to have been influenced by F. What about a combination of these two things? So by looking on this plot, you can tell which combination of frequency and prosody best predicted word birth. What is it? Half. Sorry? Half and half. Uh, close, right? So here's half and half. So slider bar alpha is at 0.5, right? We go up here. It's actually not that good. So it's not half and half. It's more about 0.2, right? So here, this is the lowest point here. It's the strongest anti-correlation at this point. So <coughs> alpha of 0.2 means what in terms of F and P? The fourth bit frequency than the um, property. Exactly, right? So in terms of trying to predict, if we want to try and predict for any given word how early that child uttered that word for the first time, our best bet for doing so, if all we're given is F and P, is to say the child was mostly influenced by F, for about four-fifths F and one-fifth P, right? So P mattered, but not as much as F, right? So we've now gone from using one aspect of the child's experience to try and predict how they're learning language to another visualization that tries to show us two features of that child's experience and what combination of those two features predicted word birth. Let's imagine that this series of dots here was a completely flat horizontal line. What would that mean? Not quite. Well, it would be equal weight because at 0.5, right? But if the, if the line was flat, that means regardless of, the, of alpha, it doesn't matter what combination of these two we set. It, it's no different in being able to explain more or less of the child's word birth. Imagine that it was a flat line way up here at zero. What does that mean? There's no, there's no correlation at all. So the color of clothes that the kid was wearing that day, right? That's, that's F. And P is the air, ambient air temperature in the house that day. Those are two other features, which maybe, I don't know if we could get from this data. Those are two features which I'm assuming probably don't influence word birth very much. They would probably produce a horizontal line near zero. The fact that we have something that is far from zero means we went on this fishing expedition into the data and we caught something. Right? We haven't pulled out the full story. The full story is pretty complicated, but we've at least got the tip of the iceberg here. So if it's a flat line like that, does that mean that you should take away one of those metrics and add in a new one, or does it mean that you should just add a new metric and keep measuring? Good question. So what do we do after we've caught something or after we've caught Nothing, right? We're not sure what's, what's going on. If it's a horizontal line that's far from zero, that means we, we, we've got something, right? So maybe one of the, the features matters in combination with something else that we're not measuring. If the line is flat at zero, we should probably throw both features back in and go fishing for something else, right? So it's interesting to think about this progression, right? Where do we go from here? How can we, in a principled manner, start to collect more and more features 
and determine in what combinations they predict word birth. So we take every permutation of the features and we find the minimum, so it has the, the lowest minimum value. You could if you had a pretty powerful computer, right? This becomes a pretty computationally intensive task very quickly, right? Lots of combinations and permutations here. Remember, each one of these dots here corresponds to hundreds of word births that are being pulled out of raw audio and video data. This is a pretty computationally expensive thing to, to do. Okay. All right, this is pretty good timing. So we'll end with this last slide for lecture 19, which uh, Deb Roy actually talked about in his TED talk. This is the one that I think is really exciting. This one is really interesting. They seem to have captured something here that was previously unknown about language acquisition. Um, as we talked about last time, this is, an ev this is evidence of scaffolding. And it's a very interesting form of scaffolding. They took each individual word birth. So every time a child uttered a word for the first time, they took that point in time. And they then went backwards in time in the data and forward in time in the data. And as they went back in time and forward in time, or sorry, they lined up all of the words um, at the same point. So they're normalized. Words were born at different months. They moved all these words so they were at month zero. They went into the past for each given word, and they looked for other utterances that contained that word. So let's imagine the word was water. They start going backwards in time, and they hear one of the caregivers say, want water? When they hear want water, that's an utterance that has two words in it, one of which is, uh, one of which is the word we're interested in. And as they go further back into the past, they heard, uh, they heard longer utterances. Do you want water? At this point, when they captured, uh, when they captured the word, they had the length of the utterance. So maybe the first time the child uh, wanted water, the child didn't just say water, but maybe the child said, want water. So the first time the word was born, it was born in an utterance that contained two words. So that utterance had a word length of two. As they go back in time, they see that the utterances that contain that word become increasingly long as they go into the past and also increasingly long as they go forward in time. So as they go forward in time, the caregivers start to say things like, do you want water? Do you want more of this water? Do you want the water from the red or the blue cup? Longer and longer utterances that contain the word water. So how is this evidence of scaffolding? Where's the, what's the scaffolding here? I think you mentioned this in the video, but it's that, uh, like, like they would like add more scaffolding um, based upon how well the child was doing, and then they would gradually remove it. Exactly right. So the scaffolding here, you can think of scaffolding as shortening of utterances, right? Making things simpler for the child, not unlike putting wheels on a on a training bicycle, right? So they started with little to no scaffolding. Do you want water from the red cup? And just before the word water was born, they were saying things like water, water, want water, water, more water, things that were relatively short utterances. They put a lot of scaffolding on. Then the word was born, and then they gradually removed the scaffolding. How did the parents know when the child was going to utter the word? So the parents seemed to be adding scaffolding before the child, months before the child has ever said the word. This is kind of the exciting part of this discovery. What's going on here? It's like a magic trick. How can, this, how can this be the case? The parent doesn't know that four months from now, the child is going to utter the word water for the first time. Is that group between the caregiver and the child? Absolutely, right? Now, what is going on in that feedback loop that allows the parent to sort of zoom in and start to say, okay, I need to start adding, adding scaffolding. They're getting ready to say the word water for the first time. One aspect of that feedback loop is that the parents probably learning about the child's word antecedents. So if you go back and listen to the video, for this child, Gaga kind of meant water for a long time, right? Gaga started to turn into Wawa. 
So they were getting closer. It seems that the child, even if you listen to that audio track, you can sort of feel the child getting closer to the adult form of that word. The feedback loop between the parent and child, there's probably rich signals in there saying, the child's not going to say water for the next three months, but three months from now, they're going to utter that word, scaffold them, right? So it's not just the case that the parents or the caregivers are teaching the children language. The children are teaching the parents. The children are providing signals about what they need, what kind of scaffolding they need in order to birth a new word, right? This is, this is pretty amazing. The feedback loop between parent and child is that bi bidirectional. Okay, I think we'll leave it there uh, for today. You have a quiz due tonight. You have deliverable 10 due tonight. And you can go uh, have a look at report one. And we'll see you on Friday. Did you have a question? Are we stopping the quizzes at 30, or are we going to go over 30? We are going to go over 30. We will continue quizzes up to and including the last class. Okay. And then I will normalize it back down to 30. Okay. Yep. Okay.